So with that, I'd like to welcome and thank today's presenters. Uh, on the line, we have Su Susan Mulkey. She's the Manager of Communica Communication and Extension for the Canadian-based British Columbia Community Forest Association. Susan has a background in community development, planning, and advocacy for rural communities. She's worked as a consultant, a mediator, and facilitator with an emphasis on projects involving citizen engagement, strategic planning, policy development, and change management. Susan lives with her family in gardens on Kootenay Lake in Caslow. In addition, we have Ron Krishner, who graduated from UBC with a degree in forestry in 1981, and since then has worked in various locations and capacities with the Ministry of Forest, mostly in civil culture and timber tenures. Ron's been in his current position as a senior timber ten tenure forester involved with community forests and woodlot licenses since 2004. His main function is to develop policy, legislation, and regulations for these programs and provide guidance to ministry staff and licensees. So we're going to move to the next slide. I'm just going to overview uh, the agenda. These are the two presenters that we just talked about. Uh, so we've had some introductions. We're going to move to the formal presentation component of the webinar, where we've allowed lots of time for discussion and conversation, and then just five minutes for closure. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Susan. Hi, Susan. Sorry, could, Susan, could you please um, hit star seven to unmute your, uh, your audio? Star seven. There you are. We can hear you now. Great. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, and thank you to everyone for managing the technical difficulties. It's uh, my um, congratulations to Darby and to Carrie and um, staff there for navigating what's probably one of the most challenging presenters' issues ever, were, ever which is the technical one. So kudos to you guys, and, and here we go. I'd like to just uh, welcome you and thank you for joining in. This was a last minute on um, Community Forestry is filling the space for someone else who had uh, canceled. So I, I thank you for being interested enough to join in at the last minute. And um, it's my pleasure to tell you a bit about Community Forestry. Um, I hear that you can change the, the slides yourself. So if you're doing that, I will be knowing that you want me to hustle along. So, I, my slides have a lot of pictures in it because I think that the, the visual aspect of community forest really tells our story. And this is first page has a picture of, of where I live in the middle there. That's Kootenay Lake. We've got some kids and, and old folks and young folks from here at Proctor and some uh, scenes from seashells. Just give you a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, just what really is community forestry, and to tell you a little bit about community forestry around the world, just to get a context. I'm going to talk about the community forest agreement, which is what the tenure is we have here in British Columbia. I'm going to tell you about what we see as some of the benefits and talk some about my association, of the Community Forest Association, and then what we're up against in the world right now. So a definition. You can see it there. It's really all about, not unlike the title of the, of the talk today, it's really about local people having a say in the management over the local resources for the benefit as they define it. Community forestry is happening all over the world. And it's been going on, uh, BC is a bit of a latecomer to it. Uh, it's been going on in Nepal and India for um, almost 40 years. And governments really recognize it, particularly in developing, developing countries, as a tool for um, uh, reclaiming degraded ecosystems, recognizing that it's local people who who have the, the greatest investment in the stewardship of local land. 
and it's also seen as an incredible way for local people to um, find uh, an income and, and their livelihoods off of the land surrounding their community. I've traveled a bit with community forestry uh, down in the States. Most of the land is private, but here, City of Arcata, they've been managing some pieces of land that they've purchased for over 50 years. And you can imagine it's there in California, and it's, um, you know, lots of high visibility for the politics around forestry. Nepal, uh, it's a lot about uh, subsistence. Uh, for local people. I visited a number of places where they're using the Forest Stewardship Council certification to, to make paper. In the bottom slide there on the right-hand side, you can see the Luca bark, and that's what they use to make the, the certified paper. It's just a beautiful product and really makes a difference in people's lives. Here I am in Montenegro where they're using community forestry as a tool to, um, to re repatriate land that was taken over during the communist area and giving it back to uh, communities. So in BC, it's not a new thing, even though the program is somewhat new. 1945, there was a royal commission, and uh, actually I believe there were two actually, but started back in 1945 recommending that municipalities should be able to manage the land around their local community. First one started in Mission, but it wasn't until 1998 that the government of the day said, let's, let's give, a, give it a try, let's do a pilot program. And there were, um, I think, 80 communities that expressed interest. There were 10 communities that were granted the right to, to have a, an experimental community forest that, that really captured quite a range of different approaches and models to what a community forest would be. Then in 2003, there was the forest revitalization plan and a take back of 20% of the um, allocated annual allowable harvest from the major forest companies which then um, a portion of that came to community forests. And I'll show you how the program really did expand at that point. And uh, last year, the roundtable on forestry rec really recommended more community forests. There's, there's a lot of communities that don't have one, but who would like one. Which reminds me, Darby, I was supposed to ask about the poll. Yeah, would you like to do that now, or should we? Maybe this is a good segue back to that. Sure, absolutely. Um, Darby has set up a couple of, of questions just to get a bit of a, an idea where the participants on this call come from. Darby, do you want to show those now? Here's a poll question. Um, yeah, please, uh, attendees, if you could just click on the appropriate one for you. Do you have a community forest in your community? Yes, no, or not sure? Okay, you can see about 11 of us have responded there. Okay, it, uh, oh, it seems to have gone back. <laughs> I'll go over to the next question. Okay, sorry, that's the same one. Here we go. Our next question, if you have a community forest in your community, how successful has it been? Yeah, please uh, indicate which one is most appropriate. Highly, moderately, somewhat, a little, or not. Got two, two there. Four, five, still moving. Six. Okay, Susan, we seem to have uh, finished there. Okay, so I can go back. Go back to the. Back to the presentation. There we are. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thanks, folks. Okay. These seem to have moved themselves around. 
Now, audience, please, if uh, uh, attendees, if you could please not touch those uh, those arrows at the bottom left-hand corner. Um, that's just for our presenters, for Susan uh, and Ron. Thanks. Okay, so I'd just like to tell you what the province, um, in in their wisdom of why they wanted to um, create more community forests and, and strengthen the program, uh, what their objectives are. They see that uh, it, there's a benefit in long-term management of a particular area and that managing for community priorities, whatever they may be, is a good thing. Uh, diversifying the, the tenure fabric, the, the quilt of tenures in British Columbia, that there's strength and diversity. There's power in the community being involved in their, their um, in, in these forest management decisions. Uh, again, the, the wisdom of the environmental stewardship. They think there's some power in uh, communities being, forests being managed by communities that, that lends to innovation and greater safety in the forest, and certainly strengthening relationships uh, within the community and uh, in quite a, quite a number of our community forests, strengthening the relationship between the native and non-native community. Community forests are a renewable forest license, a long-term <laughs> license, so it means it's renewed um, before the end of that. I think it's renewed every 10 years. But it's, it, it goes on in perpetuity. Um, it's area-based, which means it's not just like a, in, in other forest licenses, it's volume-based. So the, the, the licensee would, would be able to access a particular target of volume, but it could be anywhere in the timber supply area. With a community forest, it's, it's design, there's an area that's designated, and it has an annual allowable harvest identified. So it doesn't change over time. If it does, it's with participation of the community. The community forest agreement provides on um, the, the holder with the exclusive right to harvest there. They're the only ones, nobody else can come in. And an opportunity to manage for a full range of values. Um, it still is pretty much a, ten, a timber tenure, but we do have a right to manage for the other values that are within that designated area. And even though we have that right to manage beyond timber, we still follow all of the same rules of the provincial forest management. Here you can see how the program has expanded and the, the, the big leap there where you can't really see the, um, the dates underneath it, but there uh, you can see the, the big leap with 25 and, or 26 and 28 in the blue section of communities that were invited to participate in the program. You can see over time how the, the green area is getting bigger. And then this orange area at the end is a full uh, long-term tenure. Where the green area still speaks to that probationary status that was in the, um, the pilot program. It's a bit of a holdover. But you can see how communities are transitioning to the long-term as the program uh, matures. So here we are now, 54 communities are involved in the program at, at some stage of application, uh, still in that probationary period, or in the long term. And still it looks like it's a lot of cubic meters a year, a lot of hectares, but we are still very, very small, being 1.5% of the provincial harvest. There's an application process that's required. Um, the, the steps are that a community expresses interest. Uh, that interest goes to um, the minister and to his staff. If there's a, an area where, um, where that can be appropriate for a community forest uh, and there's agreement to move ahead, the minister will invite a community to apply. 
that means that there is an application process where the community has to really go um, get organized, sit down together, and identify what it's going to be for them. How do they want it to look? What are the values? What do they want it to achieve? And how will they organize themselves? So you can see once again that um, the pictures try to describe some of the values that um, that management plan would, would need to incorporate. That picture in the middle there with the tents and the lake, that's the Caswell Jazz Festival. And it, the, our community forest sits right behind looking down on that. So in that management plan, it, within the application process, one of the things that a community must decide is how they will be organized. How will their governance, um, what kind of a governance model will they choose? What we say about community forests is that there's no cookie cutter approach. So there is a full range of structures everywhere from um, nonprofit societies, and cooperatives to um, limited companies that are and corporations that where the license is held by a municipality, a holding company is created, and then there's an arm's length corporation. Um, there's also some limited partnerships, which are the preferred model these days for um, native non native partnerships. It's very complex in the choice that people make around their, their governance model, trying to uh, preserve cer certain rights and privileges that a uh, municipality may have or a, a First Nation may have within uh, tax structures, et cetera. And then there's different board models. Some of them are, rep some of the community forest boards are represented only by municipal officials. Um, some of them are from appointees from the municipal officials to sit on the, uh, the board. Some of them just represent chief and council. And then, of course, in a place like Caswell, we have an, a, um, a, a society where the members are selected from the membership. However, a seat is uh, set aside for the regional district to appoint someone and one from the village to appoint someone. So the point here is that um, there's a lot of different options, and I get a lot of calls from people saying, so what's the best one? And that's really up for the, the community and their specific situation to make that determination. These logs, these big pumpkins here are from Herrick Proctor Community Forest just down on Kootenay Lake. So I'd like to talk just a bit about the benefits. And of course, those benefits are going to vary from community to community. Whoops. Hi, Susan. Sorry, I'm just going to um, jump in here. Um, attendees, if you could please not uh, touch the, uh, the audio, video uh, components on, on the left, including uh, switching the slides. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost uh, Susan's video line that the feed seems to have gone on us. So we're just going to leave it uh, blank at this time. So I could try again. Sure, if you don't mind there. I just clicked on it. I'll see if it, it, if it shows up. Great. Thanks, Susan. But please do proceed. Okay. So benefits. Um, you can see that there, that there's a full range of them. As I said, it, it depends from community to community how an individual community will make their priorities. So I'll tell you a bit about that range. For the Cheslata Carrier First Nation, um, they have a community forest up by Burns Lake. Unfortunately, they had a huge fire this year. And um, as to the extent, I know that it hit some of their plantations and to some of their, their standing timber. So that's going to be something really heartbreaking. I know it's already heartbreaking, but it will be interesting to see what happens up there, the new development. But in the meantime, it's been an incredible opportunity for their people. And you can see what Mike Robertson, um, who's been somebody who has worked with them for a long time, is that it's home. 
uh, the community forests really leveraged a connection for them that they they had lost out on through um, politics and and events of years ago. It's an incredible thing, West Bank First Nation too. They've got people who are going to work and keeping their equipment up to date uh, because they know that the community forest will have work for them, whereas. Um, in the past, maybe they wouldn't keep their truck licensed or in good repair to be able to go to work. It's really made a difference for them. A great story from Likely that um, they're 70 kilometers from Williams Lake and their um, ambulance, that you could see the, the road going by when you were in it in the back because of the holes in the floor. So some of the, the profits from their community forest, they bought a first response vehicle. That's quality of life. And then there's um, down in Herrick Proctor, as I said, down here on Kootenai Lake. In the mid-1990s, there were huge uh, arrests, demonstrations and arrests, uh, when Spokane Forest Products wanted to put a logging road in. Most of these people there were arrested. Not turning for me. Not going here. I can I can help you. Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> Shall I keep going? Even? Okay. It, just if you show me that whole one there. Okay, and again. And the next one. Okay, so here's the first load of logs coming out of Herrick Proctor once they got there. Um, community forest agreement. Basically, they said, if this land is not going to be put into a park, then if it's going to be in, in the working forest, then we want to be the ones to manage it. And we will manage it for water quality, uh, quantity, and timing of flow. That's their priority. If they don't make any other money past that, um, they're happy if they've been able to put their, their management system in. And they're actually some of the most innovative with the value-added part of community forestry as well. So there's their benefit they prioritized, which was water. Here's Burns Lake with some, some students. It's an incredible opportunity for long-term trials. Because of the long-term um, aspect of the tenure, there's a lot of room for seeing what happens over time. That in some of the area-based tenures, it's more like a research forest in that way which in a uh, volume-based tenure, it's just not possible in the same way. Burns Lake has also been really a leader in putting in infrastructure for recreation and tourism. And because of some of the liability issues, uh, they couldn't put actual uh, mountain biking trails on the community forest, but what they did with some of their profits was buy some land which then could be turned into um, mountain biking trails. But I think these pictures are just from some of the rec trails right on their community forest. McBride is another one of our, our long-term community forests. That top picture there shows the view from the village. That's their community forest. Part of their management plan says that uh, their, their harvesting plans, their, their harvesting activities will not negatively impact the uh, tourism um, visual quality objectives that they have. They rely a lot on, on, on tourism, and they want it to look really beautiful. So it's got to be a lighter touch or in some creative, innovative layout so that it doesn't show. And they, they do uh, quite a bit in the value-added arena as well. Um, the posts and rails out of cedar that otherwise would have been just um, put on the waste pile they're putting people to work through these um, small value-added operations. One of our great stories to tell is what's going on out in seashells on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, the community forest there has a partnership with a local log home builder where they let them go out into a, to a new area that will be that's set for harvest. They hand pick their trees, 
that they they want to um, turn into their product. They are, um, you see the sling in the upper left-hand picture there. It's handled very carefully and then pressure washed so that the bark comes off. And it's just turned into these beautiful, beautiful high-end um, homes sold all over the world. But they're using um, low-grade cedar. They're using um, a small amount and putting 22 full-time employees to work. And then the community forest, for the special handling and that opportunity to go in first, get quite a, um, a markup from the market-based price. It's really a win-win and quite a partnership that a lot of community forests would like to see come to their town. The picture here is Quinell Lake where um, they went to get some beetle. Quinell Lake is a big um, area for uh, likely community forests. And the manager sent the, the logger who lived right on the lake there to manage that block saying, I want you to go home every night and tell me if you like what you see. And I think Pat Bell really captured that in his comment that community forests own the principle of social license and have a, a real opportunity to pilot ideas and innovate. And it's, it's, um, we really aspire to that. So I'd like to tell you about BCCFA, which is the organization I work for. There's really just two of us who have uh, contract positions. My partner, uh, Jennifer Gunter, she's our executive director, lives here in Caslow as well. The fact that the two of us live here in Caslow means that's the, um, the home base for the Community Forest Association. We are a nonprofit society, and I get my direction from our members. And um, we started with 10. We now have 50 members. I'm trying to click again, Darby. I'll help you along. Here we go. Here we are. Okay. So we have two main functions. We work with Ron Greshner and his colleagues on provincial policy, trying to um, make the best situation for community forces that we absolutely can in collaboration with the provincial government. And then we have a role in education and networking um, for our members. There you are. We put on an annual conference. This year we were in um, West Bank. It was the first time we were ever hosted on the traditional territory of one of our members. And uh, it was a, a great opportunity for people to get together. I think some of our, our best sessions are where we've got a roving mic where people just share stories on a, on a subject. Everybody benefits so much from the experiences of others. One of the things we, we did um, last year, we were contacted at the beginning of September to um, see if community forests were interested in contributing wood to the Olympic podium. Uh, it was an amazing, um, unequivocal yes by my, my members, and 14 of the 23 podiums were made out of wood donated by community forests. It was an incredible moment of pride for everyone. Those are the kids from Likely sending off the wood from the Likely community for us. So what's going on for community for us now of what um, my job to focus on? Uh, we're working with the provincial government to, to see how we can make that recommendation from the uh, working roundtable to create more community forest agreements. It's uh, native and non-native communities who are interested in this. Um, as I said before, there were 80 at the beginning who wanted one. I think there's, in my latest estimate, there's at least 40 who, are, who are, have expressed interest. Uh, 40 additional communities in BC who have expressed interest to be involved in the program. There's also a point around the size. 
Um, economy of, of scale play a big factor in forestry, and really to provide the, the goals of the community to for the benefits, um, a lot of them could be bigger. They, they range from 1,000 cubic meters um, in Banfield to 22 in Herrick Proctor to, I think, 50 or 60 in McBride. Um, there's some that are larger that, that are potential that um, have just come in from transfers from uh, tree farm licenses that belong to First Nations. But I think that, that everyone would agree that, that 20,000, which is the average, is just too small to really be efficient. In administrative efficiencies, uh, we describe ourselves as uh, sometimes the square peg in the round hole. Because we are small and we work under the same legislation that all of the major licensees do, um, and because we're area-based, there's some ways that um, we're working with the provincial government to see if we can streamline um, how we have to do our work so that um, there's some cost benefits through our administrative structures. And also, we're learning more about uh, carbon, about potential in biofuels, and potential in value added. We're um, now that the program is, is, has been there for, for over 10 years, uh, people have established, a number of community forests have established themselves and they're ready for the next stage of, of exploring opportunities. Some of the um, projects that we're focusing on right now within BCCFA is a um, value-added fiber supply, trying to connect uh, value-added manufacturers with community forests to just see where the synergies are. Uh, this is an exciting project, and uh, we hope to be starting this up soon. I talked about the square peg in the round hole, forest management, some of the planning tools and development tools that um, have been developed, have been developed for larger tenure holders. So we're working with the Alex Fraser Research Forest and UBC to um, adapt those and make some tools that will create some more efficiencies for community forests as we uh, do from the beginning of the, the application through to subsequent long-term planning for, um, for the, the operating area. Governance, as I said, um, there's no cookie cutter approach. But there's something that my colleague uh, Jen and I have been trying to do off the corner of our desk since 2003, which is do an analysis, do, first do a compilation of all of the different models that are being used and um, the different policies that have been put in place by communities um, and get them all in one place. Do an analysis over the uh, gov different governance structures, the organizational models, and do a bit of a, a, um, an analysis on them to see uh, where the benefits and challenges are in the different approaches. I get calls and, and emails every week for, do you have a template for how to hire a manager, or do you have a, um, uh, some, some board development work? It it's just would be nice to have that all in one place. So uh, the forest management and governance is a project we've just started. And then as a thread through um, all of these, these three components, we are working with UBC to develop a, a really proper uh, extension program. In the states with their universities, they have a function where there's an extension person that is attached, it creates a liaison function between the field of the community forest and the, the university, and it's really exciting, and there's been lots of take up um, at the universities for this. The, um, they just started this week a community and Aboriginal forestry component, so it's very, very exciting and also very long term, but something we're, we're, we're really thrilled about. Oops. I skipped. So, Robin Hood, our president, um, 
says it probably the best way that, that we don't just work in community forestry, we live it. You can imagine that if you're on a community forest board or if you're a manager and you live in a rural community, that if somebody has an opinion about what's going on in the community forest, they may tell you about that opinion at the grocery store lineup, at the hockey game, um, at the beach, at the pub. There is no getting away from it, and sometimes it will take you out of the back of your knees. It's not always easy. In fact, one manager said it's the hardest thing he's ever done. But it also is a pretty amazing thing when you stand down and look up and say, hey, this, this, the forest surrounding our community is managed by the community. It's a, it's a rare opportunity, and there's not, a, there's not a single community that has said no when they were offered the opportunity. Everybody has said, yes, we'll take it on, even with those risks. And that's what I have for you today. This picture actually is from uh, Bella Coola. A couple of big brown guys walking on a trail. So Darby, that's it for, for the presentation. Great, Susan. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for an excellent presentation there. Um, yes, we'd like to turn now to the uh, discussion uh, portion of, uh, of this presentation. Um, Please, right now, uh, well, I'd also like to remind you that uh, Ron Greshner is also uh, available here. I'll switch this back over to, to me, one second here. Um, Ron Greshner is also available here for questions. He's from the Ministry of Forests and Range. We've got a few discussion questions here just to, to encourage just that, questions and discussion. If you do have a question, could I ask you right now to please go up to the feedback button that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. And just please change the uh, the indicator from uh, from green to what is purple, and at that point we will uh, we will address you, and uh, the presenter can speak to your question. Does anyone have a question out there? Great, uh, Rick Bromps. Rick, um, if you could please hit uh, star seven on your on your phone line. And that should uh, unmute your the audio line for you. And please uh, ask your question. Hi, Rick. Are you having any troubles there? If you just hit star seven on your phone line, that should uh, should get you there. Hello. Hi. Is that you, Rick? Yeah. Great. Please, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Um. I um just on the uh you know all the pictures uh that you have on there it all shows these uh you know mostly saw logs except for some of the house logs but one of the challenges is trying to deal with the uh the non saw log portion of these licenses and I'm just wondering what the uh association if they're doing marketing in the in the area of trying to trying to find a home for some of the uh the non saw log portion a really good question. It's like people just show pictures of their smiling baby and not the one that's crying. Yeah. <laughs> it's um within our value added comp project, there's a, a huge component there for the on the the biofuel function. Uh, at our conference last year, we had um, um, Ken Day from the Out Research Forest who gave a great presentation on some research that they had done on small-scale biofuels and what you needed, how to do it, um, how far it was economical to transport it, when you should chip, how to chip it, um, how to transport it. And um, as far as the community forest marketing anything, we don't serve in that function as a marketer for our members. Everybody does their own marketing. But within our value-added project, we hope to be able to at least get some information on our website that tells what products people have available. But I will tell you one thing that I heard from West Bank. They, um, they had, Ron, help me if you can remember the numbers, but they had 3,000 piles uh, that would have been slash burn um, last, last year. And this year they had three. 
because they shipped everything down to the coast for with chips. So there's uh, that's a lot about proximity to market and the whole thing, but it does talk about potential. Yeah, and the stuff they were shipping down to the coast was for uh, heating uh, nurseries down there that uh, grew, uh, you know, vegetables and, and stuff. Well, a lot of times it's not viable, I, you know, and it's it's difficult for these uh, community forests to, especially the ones with a lot more uh, non-sawlog material. Like within the beetle areas. Well, the beetle areas and also in the transitional uh, forest uh, with the hemlock, you know, the poor quality hemlock. So it's always, everybody always wants your saw logs, but they don't want your non-saw logs too, too often. Yeah. Well, it's really a challenge, and it's one thing that within a business plan for a community forest, you're going to have to to look at if if there is a lot of your volume that that is um, not marketable. You you know, community forests have to run as a viable small business first and foremost. You can have all the dreams you want, but that's an important uh, baseline reality that everybody has to face. So the um, you know, I, I guess what I'd like to say is I, I think that, that there's a lot of opportunities to be explored. The Green Heat Initiative, um, David Dubois has a lot of information about small-scale um, heating things. He says start small, heat your school, heat a municipal building, and maybe there's a partnership for a community forest, at least to reduce some of that uh, stuff that would otherwise go into the, to the um, flash pile. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Rick, for your for your question. Are there any other questions out there? Again, if you could use the feedback uh, indicator to indicate you have a question, that'd be great. Okay, um, Kathy, Kathy LaForge, uh, if you could please hit uh, star seven and ask your question. And also, uh, Susan, if, if you could please try and reestablish your uh, your video. Um, oh, there you are. It, it seems I can see Ron. Okay, there. Okay, it is working again. Kathy, are, are, have you hit star seven? Are you there? I think I'm there. Great. We can hear you. Please, uh, please go ahead. Hey, I guess to follow up on Rick's question, I'm from Vanderhoof, and we definitely are in the heart of the mountain pine beetle issue. We don't have a community forest, and it's something that we've talked about over the years numerous times. But I, I'm finding right now that there seems to be a lot of competition between the major licensees, the uh, First Nations, the woodlot owners, all the various people trying to make a living on the forest. Um, a lot of competition for what we're, would we really do have out there. And so it seems to me for the municipality to sort of get involved in a community forest, maybe just adding more pressure and perhaps uh, impacting the survival of some of the other folks that are out there. Yeah, I that's possible. It's a fixed land base, so there's only so many trees and, and uh, so much area. So if a community forest is created, then that volume had to come from someplace else, whether that be for a First Nations or for a, a municipality. But how does a community forest, in terms of um, all the uh, inner workings of it, how does it compare with a uh, woodlot and the responsibilities of a woodlot owner? Ron, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I, I can handle that one. Yeah, so, so in essence, it, they're the same in terms of the way the ministry looks at it, and they both have to follow the same rules under the, the Forest Act and under the uh, Forest and Range uh, Practices Act. So all is the difference in size. They're both area-based tenures. Uh, a woodlot is, is maxed out in size in tier of 1,200 hectares maximum. On the coast, there are 800 hectares maximum. Uh, the only difference that we have is, is, is in the, some of the planning under FERPA, uh, Woodlots have to do a, what's called a woodlot license plan, while the community forests have to do what's called a forage stewardship plan. But the, uh, essentially, the uh, content requirements of those plans are, are more or less the same. So uh, 
when you look at one versus the other, they both have the same responsibility. Any area they have to, that they harvest, they have to uh, reforest and bring back to what's called a, a free-to-grow state. You know, they both have to have management plans. They both have to uh, prepare, like I said, these woodlot license plans or forest stewardship plans. And they both have to, they both have a, what's called an allowable cut that, that gets figured out. And then they have a five-year, uh, what's called a cut control period to, to manage uh, that cut. So oh, are they challenged by the size of their, um, their areas as well that to make it viable? Like Wood lots or community forests? Well, oh. it sounds like community forests uh, need to get larger, and I'm wondering if that's the same concern with the um, woodlots. Uh, we haven't really had that uh, issue come up from the from the woodlot focus. As you can appreciate, woodlots are typically uh, managed by uh, a family or a person uh, just to support that that one or two people and. Uh, in doing so, and, and also when the woodlot program was, was originally uh, initiated, uh, the, the plan of them was just to be a, a uh, it was typically for ranchers to be a uh, uh, another source of income uh, in case, you know, when ranching, the ranching side of their industry was, was, was suffering, they could go towards their woodlot and, and garner some extra income, but it was never thought to be uh, their sole source of income. It would just be a sort of an added income. So. We never looked at it in that light, and I guess because of that, the, the, the proponents that got these woodlot license, licenses understood that, and so there hasn't been any issue in terms of, uh, at least I haven't heard any issues in terms of that, that they're not being the, the proper size for them to be viable for, for their purposes. Oh, maybe it's again more of a local issue, but it seems like uh, some of the lot, uh, woodlot owners in our area seem to be struggling at the moment. So. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, in the Vanderhoof area, it was, it was hard hit uh, with because you're predominantly pine up there with the mountain pine beetles. So, so now, for the most part, a lot of those woodlots that are up there are, uh, you know, standing dead trees, and, and obviously, uh, you know, and, and because of the world economy too, the pr uh, market pricing of, of, of timber has gone down considerably. So, uh, everybody in, 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 uh, in the logging industry right now is, is, is suffering because of that. Right. Thank you, Ben, for your input. It's not a great time to be in forest. <laughs> Hi, sorry, it's Darby here again. I'm just going to interject here. Uh, please, if, if you could uh, not use the arrows on the bottom left-hand uh, corner of the, the screen, that's uh, just for presenters still at this, at this time. Um, the, the presentation is available through the handouts in the top right-hand corner. You can download, download the presentation from there at the PDF. Kathy, was there anything more? That, um, I appreciate your input. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much. If you if you don't mind just uh, changing your indicator back to green, that would be wonderful. And I see that, uh, Chilan, um, you have a question. Could you please hit star seven and, and ask your question? Hi. Hi there. Um, I just have a question for Ron. You were mentioning that the um, primary difference between a community forest and a woodlot is generally their maximum size, and you spurted out the numbers really quickly. Can you repeat those, please? Okay, so for, for woodlot license, they have a maximum size. It's in the Forest Act. So on the coast, their maximum size is 800 hectares, and in the interior, their maximum size is up to 1,200 hectares. And for community forest, there is no maximum size, nor a minimum. Thank you very much. Welcome. Are there any other questions out there? If there are no questions, uh, oh, there we are. Sarah, great. Um, please, could you hit star seven and uh, ask your question? Uh, hi, Darby. It's Chris. Oh, hi, Chris. I'm in uh, Sarah's office. Oh, okay. Super. I had a question um, just about what is the what is the governance model that seems to work best for local governments? Well, um, that's a really good question. There's um, there's a few different variables that that um, contribute to how best to respond to that. 
Like I said, we haven't really done the full analysis, but I can tell you a little bit about some of the issues that have come across my desk through the years. Um, it seems to be that that's um, the provincial government's preferred uh, model for an invitation is to go have more of a government to government, local government to provincial government relationship with um, inviting a municipality. So the municipality says, we have the license in our name, we need to have control. So a number of them have gone that model. Revelstoke uh, Forest Corporation started up in the early 90s when they bought a tree farm license, a local tree farm license. And they're not in the community forest. Oh, you just called. What do you mean, what? They're not in the community forest program, but they are um, one of our members and kind of our grandfather. But the, the point is that they adopted a model that a lot of communities have subsequently adopted, where they have a holding company, the municipal, municipal government creates a holding company, and then a, an arm's length um, management corporation. It gives the um, municipality the, um, it, it's still managed under the, um, the board is appointed by the um, council, but it's, um, the municipality is protected by any liability. So is that like a holding company above? Is it like sort of like a parent company, and then underneath it is the arm's length management company? That's right. And then who's the board is at both levels or at just at the parent? Um, as far as I understand, it's just at I don't, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I think sometimes it's it's the same. Um, some some municipal governments just have the arm's length corporation without out that holding company, as in the case of McBride. I believe Burns Lake has the same model that Revelstoke has. So it's like a it's an in Canadian incorporated company or a provincially incorporated company that may have councillors sitting as board members? Yes, or council has appointed board members. I think there's some mix and match there. Um, and definitely within Burns Lake, they have a seat for the Wet'suwet'en, they have a seat for the other, I think it's the Burns Lake Indian Band. Um, but it's still, um, the municipal government still holds the license. So it just mitigates some of the liability issues towards right. the municipality, but as for um, the board members, do you find, in your experience, do you see them taking out board insurance? As far as I understand, most most community forests have board insurance, yes. Okay. Yeah, certainly um, that's my experience. I haven't heard of anybody not getting it. Okay. And just one last question here. In your, from what you've seen, do you see any, um, is there any correlation between um, the governance of the municipality changing every three, maybe changing every three years and the board, or do they usually keep the same direct board of directors on the corporation? Or does that, it change with the yeah. political side of things? I would say that that is really um, up to individual communities. We've seen both. Okay. Um, and that's one of the, the questions. We, we posted this as one of the discussion questions. You might be seeing it on your screen right now. Do you right. think community forest organizations should be governed by local politicians or structured as arms, arms length from politics? And um, there's, there's some, some critical questions around that. Um, one, of the, one of the things is the new um, trade and investment the TILMA, the um, provincial relationship that BC and Alberta have now about um, municipal governments have to advertise openly on any contracts over $70,000 and I think $200,000 for infrastructure. So if you have a community forest that you're wanting to put local people to work, but you're bound by that municipal law, or, or policy that um, you have to advertise openly, 
it creates quite a, a challenge. It's something that in a town or a community forest like um, they have um, with barrier and um, because they have a society there or um, Caswell has a society, it's not bound by those rules. So that could possibly be a strength the, to, to not go with the municipal license. But the, um, the, the other point around politics, I think, is um, the likely community for us. It's the, actually the likely Hatsul community for us. And they, it's a, a limited partnership between the Soda Creek Sound and the community of likely. And they're structured that the band has their own governance um, chief and council where they appoint three people to the, to the limited company board. Then the community of, of likely has a society where they elect a board for their society and then send three people to the limited partnership board. What happens there is that it's the, the limited partnership board, which is the real management of the community forest, it's separate from politics then. You know, the, the chief can't come in there and say, I want things to go this way. His, it, it, it creates a buffer. The, um, the, the likely community has to work through their own circle first before um, their voice is then taken to the limited partnership board. And if you would ask those two entities, the, the Soda Creek Bands and Likely, they would say they have the perfect model. When, when politics are involved, um, you could ask other communities, maybe Seashells or McBride, that it can be a really big challenge. Do you, do you see uh, these community forest corporations maybe having a broader mandate in the future for more general economic development activities for communities and First Nations? I think that's the goal, and it's happening. Um, you know, Burns Lake owns a little sawmill. They they once owned a uh, broadband uh, internet company. Um, you know, they've made lots of investments up there. Some good, some that turned out to be not so good. Um, I think there's there's also different ideas about how to approach that. The ride is really on a huge campaign to attract some kind of value added manufacturer, not unlike. Um, that Seashell has with the uh, uh, log home company. Well, is that something that should be um, should that that new or new company be owned by the Community Forest Corporation, or should it be something that's separate and independent, where a partnership could be set up? Um, I know Herrick Proctor is is working on buying a kiln and. Um, a small mill, and they plan to have that just be an arm of their uh, community forest. So it's really so much about who sits around the table and has good ideas for their community, it seems to me. It's very personal to each community. All right, thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris, for all your questions there. I see, uh, Chalan, you have uh, another question? Yeah, it was just another point of clarification for Susan. Um, you mentioned that the um, Likely Board has six uh, participants, three are from the Hassel Band and three from, are from the uh, Likely Community Forest Society. How does that work for voting? They work in a consensus model. They've never voted. They have a fallback to consensus. They've never used it. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Any, any other questions out there? Does anyone want to? Oh, we do. We've got a few more there. Uh, Angela, please, if you could. Uh, yeah, please start them. Angela, I may not have been clear on that. If you could hit star seven to unmute your phone and then ask your question. 
Hi, that should work now, I hope. Yes, we can hear you fine. Please. Good. Wait. I'm curious to know if um, any of the community forest folks have worked with an organization called Enterprising Nonprofits to help them build board capacity or um, sort of the whole nonprofit enterprise building? To my knowledge, no. Um, I certainly have worked with with enterprising not for profits, but um, and I have sent information about that network out to them. But I don't know if anybody has 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 taken up on that. Thank you. Please, any any other questions? We could actually uh, turn it around a little bit here and uh, ask uh, a few of the discussion questions. I know one of them we've already spoken to you shortly, but uh, perhaps for the audience, uh, what stories of strengths and weaknesses can you tell about community forests in your area? Uh, does anyone in the, uh, in the audience, uh, any of the attendees, wish to speak to that? Anybody hear anything out? Just are, are there any community forests on the on the call? If you uh, if anyone's answering there, just please hit star star seven to to unmute your phone and you can speak. There may not be. challenges at, at the beginning. Um, with that said, I'd like to pass it to uh, Gary Pridmore. Just a final reminder that if you wanted to take any of those PowerPoint the presentations, the, the handouts that they're available in the top right corner to the end of this webinar, so you may wish to download those now um, if you haven't already. Um, and just really to echo what Darby has already said, um, a sincere thanks for your patience while we work through the technical glitches at the beginning of this webinar. And a, a thank you to all the participants for joining us uh, and to the presenters uh, for the valuable information that they've shared today. A reminder that we will follow up with a, with, uh, with a survey and we would really value any feedback that you have um, on today's webinar, but also uh, on future topics that you may find uh, of interest and relevant to your community. So with that, we're going to say goodbye and thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Susan. That was, uh, that was great. Okay, well, thanks. Ron, thanks yep. very much. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. I'll be sure to get a, a bit of a summary of the, of the survey um, to you as well. Great. Okay, well, good work, you guys. Okay, and again, sorry about the, uh, the challenge there to begin. Yeah, poor you guys. <laughs> it worked out okay. Well, thanks a lot. Bye. Great job. Bye-bye. The conference has been muted.